You're on the boundary, you're a speck on the boundary between planet Earth and the rest of the universe. At your feet, imagine stretching away from you, dusty vastness pockmarked with cacti. At the horizon, the sky is fenced off by the silhouettes of mountains. Half of your world is the cosmos above your head, legions of bright stars with the Milky Way stretching across it all. And your feet are lit by a dim glow, by light that has been traveling for eons, perhaps since the beginning of human civilization, perhaps since the age of the dinosaurs, and perhaps longer than that. Imagine walking into this desert, a human with a torch. But it's not an ordinary torch. It's shining with ultraviolet light. It's a frequency that we can't see. So as the beam moves around, you can't tell where it's pointing until there's a flash of light out in the desert. So you swing the torch back, and you see a scuttling, surprised patch of bright light, because this is a scorpion. And this really is how you detect scorpions in the desert. Uh, if we have the lights up a little bit. The, um, this is what enthusiasts do. If you go out to the desert in Arizona and people are looking for these arachnids, they go out with an ultraviolet torch. These people are mad. And they, they walk around in the darkness, and where you see these scuttling bright blue patches, those are the scorpions, because scorpions glow in the UV. And it's thought that the reason that they do it um, is it's really, really clever. They want to hide. Uh, this usually, the best time to do this is at dusk, even though it works, it works all the time. Um, and what the scorpion has in its character Paste is a chemical which takes in ultraviolet light. There's a lot of that about at dusk because it scatters a lot, so there's more of it than there is visible light. Um, and uh, it converts that ultraviolet light into visible light that we can see, into blues and greens. And the scorpion, the scorpion does something very cool. Um, it's got a patch on its tail that is light sensitive, not to any particular frequency, it's not an eye, but it's sensitive to light. So as its tail is held over its back, it can tell whether it's glowing. And the secret, that it's the, the, way, the giveaway that it's not hiding well enough is it can detect its own glow. So it kind of makes itself more visible than it needs to in order to be able to know where to hide. So if it can see itself glowing, uh, it has to scuttle back under rock. And that was a brilliant idea until humans invented UV torches. <laughs> Um, and this, so this is a phenomenon, it's an example, um, it's called fluorescence. Uh, you, you probably know that some things do this, so scorpions blow like that. Um, and the way that this works is that uh, the, whatever chemical is doing, it takes in light uh, at an energetic, with, a, with lots of energy, in a frequency that, a frequency that we can't see. Um, uh, so, oh, there we go. Um, and uh, it gives it back at a frequency that we, can't, we can see. So it's like a free lunch. It's the ultimate free lunch because it's using something that is useless, it's getting wasted, and then we get light. Brilliant. And so humans do use this for other things, and uh, it doesn't have to be on a dog. Um, but uh, I brought some of them with me just because I'm, a, I'm one of those people that... Um, my neighbor thinks I'm bonkers because I've always got another, I've always got toys, right? We should play with toys. So I've got a kitchen full of ridiculous things. Um, and so I've got some things here that, that fluoresce now. Where's my glass? Right. So because I am, as Helen said, a bubble physicist, that is, it's a real job. Um, so I've got, I'm going to make some bubbles. Uh, now this, this, this is going to make a lot of mess, but it's going to make everybody smell very fragrant, right? Um, this is laundry brightener. This is what you put in, um, this is what, goes in, if you've ever wondered what is in here, laundry brightener. Right, so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to point this upwards. Uh, let's do that bit last. Okay, so we have the lights down again. Right, so, okay, that's this, by the way, the scorp my scorpion here is drawn with highlighter pen, uh, which is the best 99 pens I've spent in about a year. Right, so UV jackets, the reason they glow is the same reason as scorpions, so at dusk um, they're detecting UV light, they're, they're basically if you can see someone with a UV jacket that's glowing, like in those gloomy mornings, uh, this will cheer you up in London. You're actually detecting UV light indirectly because it's telling you it's there. This is the laundry brightness stuff. Now, to see if I can make um, some fluorescent bubbles, the problem is I can't really see what I'm doing when I do this. Um, a, what this is should be 
telling you really is that I'm, a, I'm just an experimentalist at heart and I will play with anything. So anyway, it's beautiful, isn't it? This is, uh, anyone know what this is? Tonic water, yeah, the quinine blows in the UV. If you really want to scare people at a party, how cool is this, right? So anyway, so all of these things, so it's the same trick, right? And the same trick is causing, the same little physical thing is causing lots of different things. There are substances which take in energy um, frequencies that we can't see and give back frequencies that we can. Can we have the lights up again, please? I switch this off. It's very sad, isn't it, to have to switch. I want one. I'm going to have to get one of those. Um, so, um, so this is the cool thing. So this is a bit of... Uh, I think of it as physics, there's some, probably some chemists out there that want to claim it, but I think this is physics, I'm a physicist, damn it. Um, and this is a cool thing about physics as far as I'm concerned, it's that you learn something once, you learn it in one context, and it's not learning a fact, you're learning a principle, and that principle implies, applies in lots of different places. So the same thing that is keeping cyclists safe on the roads is keeping scorpions alive in the desert, and it's keeping people with white shirts, with very, very white shirts. Um, and so this is brilliant, right? Because it's basically, I've never been a lazy person, but I've realized in retrospect that choosing to study physics was possibly the laziest thing I could ever have done, because I never had to learn any facts about anything, I just had to learn a set of principles, and then I could work it out as I went along, right? Which is the fun bit. And and um, the reason that I think this matters is not just um, because uh, I think physics is cool, which it is, um, it's that we live in a society where it's easy to get very distant from the science that's going on around us. So uh, my mum was a, a computer programmer before I was born, and actually for, it was either the first or second Ada Lovelace Day, I wrote a blog for the original um, Ada blog thing, lots of people wrote blogs, um, and I wrote one about, um, my mum was mentioned in it because she was, uh, she was much more practical, she is much more practical than my dad. Um, anyway, so she was a computer programmer before I was born, um, and she programmed in uh, she, actually zeros and ones, and she she hates me telling people that because she thinks it makes her sound old. I keep telling people because I think it makes her sound cool. Um, and her father was one of the first television engineers, so back in the 50s he worked on TVs. And so uh, my mum and her brother uh, and. Her, their other sister, um, are actually really good at bits, resistors and capacitors and putting electric circuits together. They don't really know why, but they got to play with them as a kid. And um, so you can understand what my grandfather did, right? You could see it was sort of big tubes in televisions and you could see that this bit did that and this bit did that. Um, and then my mum's era, she, works, she worked with the sort of computers that you could put in a room, if you were lucky. Uh, and you could sort of see what they're doing, right? You know, you could sort of see where the bits went. You could follow the zeros and ones along. Um, and then in my lab now, I have three computers, and honestly, I couldn't take one apart and put one together again. Uh, couldn't afford to, quite apart from anything else. Um, but they, um, the point is, I understand the principles on which they operate, but I couldn't do it. And so technology, these amazing things that Ada was there at the beginning for, um, at the same time as being amazing, are sort of distancing us a little bit from the world around us, which I think is a tremendous shame. They offer us great things like um, Google and Wikipedia and places where you can look things up and YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't always use them. And I think that we have to... I think that's a... It's great that it's happened, but let's not forget where it came from, because it's, I don't want it to make people helpless. Like, that's rubbish. You have all the technology in the world, and you're sort of making people helpless. And this is why I play with toys. Um, I think of them as toys. Um, uh, I, uh, I just, I've just, uh, I'm about to start writing a book on this, and I wrote a whole thing about this at the start, and the, my literary agent went through and crossed out the word toys, because he said it makes it sound trivial, Helen, you can't put that in the book. And uh, I think, I don't care, let's, let's play with the world. And so the thing, the point is that you can take, we haven't lost access, just because we have touch, touch screen computers and all this fancy stuff and the internet which nobody understands or certainly you know imagine just think of us in this room we're, we're submerged in wi-fi signals and radio signals and uh all you know, all sorts of stuff and we're, we're blind to all of it um so th but the fun bit is that you can because there's uh, there are basic principles at the bottom of everything. They're the same principles, like physics hasn't changed just because we've got touch, touch screen computers. And the wonderful thing about that is that most of the physics, almost all of it, um, even some of the weird quantum stuff, um, you can actually test for yourself in your kitchen with bits and pieces that you find around. You're observing things every day which are teaching you about the world. And all you have to do is play with them and ask a few questions and you can see. So if you've ever tried them, um, 
if you tell it, go, go home. I'm not going to tell you the answer to this, right? But go home. Next time you have a boiled egg and a raw egg next to each other, um, set them spinning on a table. Let them spin for a bit. You look a bit weird during that bit. And then you put your finger on it. Just touch the egg and then take your finger away. Now, a different thing will happen with the raw egg and the boiled egg. And when you've worked out why, you've worked out the principle that is keeping the Hubble Space Telescope pointed very, very accurately at stars in different galaxies, right? It's the same principle. So this is just my little thing to say, let's celebrate what Ada Lovelace achieved and all the other women who've been involved in science and technology and what they've achieved. But they started, a lot of these women, the reason they could join in is because it was kitchen science, right? It was stuff that they didn't need fancy equipment or white coats or the approval of the men with big long beards to join in with, right? They could just pick things up and work it out for themselves. And I think that we shouldn't lose that. So let's celebrate all that technology, but let's not forget where it all came from. So I think we should all play with the world, poke at things, get UV lights, get frightened people at parties if necessary. Um, and, you know, remember that even though we have touch screens, the physics hasn't changed and we can play with it. And that makes us all better citizens and better human beings. Thank you very much.